All right. So let's start with, I think, one of the most interesting projects I've seen this year, which is this model does not exist.co. <laughs> so I came across this. Uh, if you go to the website, it's this uh, model generated by AI called Alice. Is that how I pronounce it? I guess so. Yeah. And it's this idea that it's an Instagram account with a new photo of a, of a virtual influencer. But it's not like Lil Michaela, if you've seen one of those that kind of look fake. Like it looks real. You know, she's got blonde hair. She looks like I can touch her and she's a real person. I wonder how many guys already fall in love with her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure many guys have fallen in love with her. And one of the most interesting things about it is you have this section where it says, help me pick tomorrow's photo. So basically the way this product works is a new photo is generated by A-List every 15 minutes. You upvote your favorite photo and the one that gets most upvoted goes on the Instagram. Is that correct? Yeah, well, there was a plan, and then until people started upvoting all the messed up, messed up photos, so now it's basically like one of the most upvoted photos gets uploaded to the Instagram. Why? Well, what happened exactly? People were. This just basically the, the the first photo is uh, is her with two hats on top of each other, <laughs> which the AI likes to do sometimes. Sometimes the eyes are a bit messed up, uh, especially the hands. It's not a good enhance, but I think there's only like 5% of the photos, 10%. The other 90% are pretty, pretty well off. But people like to upvote stupid things on the internet, right? Think about Bodie McBoat face. Right. And and how, how did you create this product? How long did it take you? Could you talk a little bit about the process of building this from concept to pressing publish? So building the product, like this product I, I did in, I think, a morning, one afternoon. But it's basically because I already built a tech before it with ProvilPicture.ai. So I already had the upload functions. I knew how to do the models. Um, so it's just basically building the website. And basically what it does is I just grabbed a bunch of photos from Stylegun, which is a it's an AI that generates like millions of fake people that don't exist. Uh, it's pretty known generated fo dot photo. I think it's a website that uses the AI, for example. So just grabbed a bunch of women that looked the same, uploaded them into my uh, training tool, picked the ones that looked like each other, trained it again. And basically then this, this one person that looks always the same uh, just came out. And I've been using that to generate the photos with. Like, why did you do this project? Like, why is it exciting to you to build a virtual influencer? So I don't, I don't like the typical way of doing marketing because it's quite boring. Uh, I'm not a good in it. I, I've tried ad, ads advertisement. I suck in advertisement. The only thing I'm good in is SEO. So what I like to do is I like to create uh, products, like launch mini products as a marketing. So I was thinking, all right, so my tool is Provo Pictures. It's basically what's, what was this model product is, but then you can do it for your own face for other people. I was like, okay, what is a great way to bring some attention to it? And what is a fun project to hack on when I'm when I get bored? And I was like, oh, maybe I should just create a fake influencer, let the community upvote for it. Maybe some other website would pick it up because it's something novel, it's something new. And then basically just put a few banners every 15 photos to my main product and use it as a marketing channel. Um, and it brings quite some revenue, which is quite fun. And the plan eventually was to like maybe monetize the technology behind this. I might do it still one day because it's quite exciting. Uh, but for now, it's like it's it's on the back burner. You know, it's five years from now. You're scrolling on Instagram. What percentage of your feed is virtual influencers like this? How fast this is going now, I'm pretty sure. Like I, I think social media, how we know it is going to be dead in five years because everything is going to be fake. So either people are going to love it or no one's going to use it because it's going to be a black forest effect. Like everything is AI. So why would you interact with a post if you can be 95% sure that this is a fake person that's hacking the algorithm? I wonder if, if you look at like Lil Michaela's Instagram, for example, Lil Michaela, I think is probably the most popular virtual influencer in the world. She still gets tens of thousands, of, if not hundreds of thousands of likes per post. Yeah, but I reckon it's because it's a novelty, right? It's it's one of a kind. It's a one thing. 
what if yeah but it can go both ways what if your whole feed is going to be ai generated what if you're talking with ais the comments are ai like you don't even know if you're interacting with a real person or not it can go both ways another way to think about it is in a world where you go into coffee shops and it's all robots like it's just a robot arm serving you and making you a latte or an espresso if they make you an incredible latte exactly how you like it would you mm -hmm. tip that robot <laughs> i mean i'm from holland we don't tip so i think that's the easy the easy answer here it depends right if if you, if you go to starbucks you don't you don't care if it's served by a robot or whatever because it's like you want to go there you you know what the taste is so you come for it but if you're going for a like a local experience you know of course you want you want a barista you can talk with so yeah it it, it depends i guess Good, my, ta yeah, my take on the virtual influencers and engagement with virtual influencers, my thesis is that people will still have that same level of connection with these people because they're invested in the story. Like, look at what's happening with, I'm sure you've seen what's happening uh, with Twitch with that Seinfeld mm -hmm. uh, AI show. Rest Could, in peace. Rest in peace. Can you actually talk a little bit about how it works? And so I don't on. know how it works. So it would be like full speculations, but I guess they just use OpenAI GPT-3 to just generate a lot of content and then have a narrator to, to turn it text to voice. I guess that's how it works. It's basically, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's basically an AI-generated endless Seinfeld parody. So you go on Twitch. It's actually banned right now. It'll, it'll come back in a few weeks, but that's another story. It's banned because, well, let me just get into it. The, the, the AI, uh, they had switched from chat GPT to another AI model. And when they did the switch, there wasn't the same level of content moderation. So it ended up doing some horrible transphobic and homophobic uh, jokes. But basically, people were going on this Twitch and they were seeing these AI generated version of Seinfeld. And there were thousands of people commenting, thousands of people tweeting about it at any given time. And it was one of the most viewed Twitch channels. And it just goes to show you that there's this demand for AI-generated content. And there's a connection that exists between viewer and content. Well, but don't you think that in five years, hypothetically... Like, why do you need content creators if if TikTok TikTok already knows so well what you like? What is your interest? Like, why would you need content creators if the AI models are so fast and GPUs are so fast? Like, why do you need anyone to create content for you if you can just create it on the fly, personalized towards you? I think that's where the future is going to go to. Yeah, I think if if AI could create better content, and when and I define better content as content that connects more with the audience then there's no place for me and you to post on instagram yeah well it's already so, happening right it's like these minecraft video backgrounds with reddit posts um that's basically being narrated and there's millions and millions and millions of views and people have no clue it's ai generated but basically there's one like one bot that just uploads thousands and thousands of videos and sees what gets sticky and that's what gets shows to people uh, yeah exactly so i think that's a trend that's that's just begun. And I think with uh, Alice, uh, your product, this model does not exist. I, I, you know, I could see this taking off. Like, what does success look like for you with this product? So it's still in my mind to turn this into a tool to let other people create their own influencers, their own characters and whatever with it. I think that's pretty interesting. People have already reached out on DMs to me, like, how can I create my own? So that's an interesting point, like an interesting way to go to. But for now, yeah, it was just like a fun project, man. I, I probably have ADD. Like, I like to ship a lot of new products. I think it's just pretty cool that it's possible to do. Uh, it's like yeah. exploring new ways, learning new things, seeing what is like the limit of AI right now. And it, it's it's mental. It's mental what you can do with it right now. If I were you, this is what I would do. Tell me. So I would build a product studio around your virtual influencers. So one way to bootstrap any social account is if you, if you do cross posting. So I would partner with like 
a CAA, a UTA, a major talent agency, or so you know, company like Doing Things Media, which owns some of the most popular meme accounts, like middle class fancy and stuff like that on Instagram. And I would say our goal is to launch one new character influencer per month that you're going to help cross promote. And then you partner with them and do a rev share with them. I would do that because it, it just helps you get to where you want to get to faster. Because your goal is the more that this spreads, the more people see your underlying technology, the yep. more revenue you ultimately create. Yeah, this would this would be the easiest organic, well, easiest would be like the way to get like a great way of marketing for this technique, for this tool. The thing is like, I have no clue. Like I know how Twitter works. I have no clue how Instagram works. I need to dive into it, see if it's interesting to me. Maybe I got a partner with someone who is like interested in this whole technology in the inside, like in social media. Is that is that a downside of being an indie, an indie hacker where you're just one person? Is that like is there a cap to how big an indie hacker project could get to? I think it's more limitation of my personality. I I get bored after three months. I used to be horrible in school. I couldn't focus. I didn't I d- didn't want to do my homework. It didn't stick because I can only work on things that really interest me. But then I can go super, super hyper focus on it. And I just lose sense of reality for like a month or whatever. And I can just ship it out. And then one day it's like the interest is gone in it. So I cannot force myself. Like like you saying, like it could be such a good idea. So if you're like an entrepreneur who who's not like me, who can like focus on the things he doesn't like to do, then. But I know my weakness and my weakness is that I need to work on things that really interest me. You follow your curiosity. Put another way, you're just following your curiosity. And I think the beauty about that is you're, you're able to ship a product like this in a morning. Like when you're following your curiosity as an entrepreneur or a maker, it gives you Superman like abilities. It it allows you to do something that is impossible. It's like when uh, a parent sees their baby, like going into the ocean. And they could swim like never before. That's exactly what it's like when you, when an entrepreneur is following their curiosity. Uh, my opinion, the downside of just following your curiosity is sometimes you do need some sort of lanes or constraints to scale products. Yep. And that's what I worry about with when you just follow your curiosity. So that's a funny thing is because if you want to dive into that topic, I've realized that I'm good at starting products. I really like to obsess about it. But there's a limit to me where I actually need someone to run it afterwards, build it out afterwards. So I've hired two people, actually. One to do the operational parts of the company, doing the content creation, doing the live chat, so basically the operational side of the company to keep it going. And I've hired a developer two weeks ago, a good friend of mine, and he's basically, I build out the products, I'm exploring it, I'm launching new ideas, and he is hired to build out once I, let's say bluntly, once I get bored of it, and he builds out all the more boring features, continues iterating and developing on it. So I can move on to the next idea and see how that works. I like that. I think that's going to be a big unlock for you. And I think once you start seeing success, and and you're seeing success with a bunch of your projects, which I want to get into, but once you start seeing traction, it makes sense like to either hire agencies, hire contractors, build out your little team. As long as you can maintain that, like, you know, follow your curiosity. Like if you can just spend all your time following your curiosity, like that's probably ideal for you. Right. Well, but it's a de- it's a deliberate uh, decision, right? Um, three years ago, I built Headline. Two years ago, I had talks with Andreessen Horowitz, Sequoia, stuff like that. Could you tell people what Headline is? So people probably heard about Jasper Copy.ai. They are uh, how do they brand themselves? I think they're copyright. They they call themselves copywriting tools, so they can write blogs for you, emails, Facebook ads, Twitter ads, and stuff like that. I was one of the first to build a product like that and go live with it. I got a screenshot from OpenAI uh, saying I'm the first developer to actually go uh, live with a product. And this was back in December 20, 
2020, yeah. And it massively blew up, man. Like people wanted this. This this was when OpenAI just went live with GPT-3, basically what chat GPT is built on top of. And it just scaled. It went like it doubled in revenue every two, three weeks, hits a shit ton of revenue in three months. And then it was the decision. Like there was so much competition. Like, am I gonna take startup funding, build out a team, hire 50 developers, and basically become a CEO? I had an acquisition offer, so I could just get a life-changing amount of money, sell the company and do something else, or I could try to bootstrap it. And I, I sat down for a week, two weeks, talked with my friends, my parents, my wife, wife now. And I just knew like it wouldn't be my life to a, work 80 hours, manage people. It's not, it's not going to make me happy. So how am I going to do that? So I decided to sell it at the time. Yeah, I mean, the C and CEO doesn't stand for curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> I think that in general, like CEO positions are romanticized. You know, you're quote unquote the boss. But I actually think that like if you're a maker, you're a builder. Um, okay, I hate like, to be the boss, man. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not fun. So mm-hmm. I love that you did that. And you, you were mindful, right? The great thing about big decisions, crossroads in business life and in life is it allows you to stop and think and ask yourself, what do you want? Like you need to figure out why are you an entrepreneur? What are you doing it for? Why are you building this company? Yeah. So this model does not exist is based on a product called profilepicture.ai, which uh, I'd love you to talk about. It's massively successful. It's got thousands of customers. So ProvoPicture.ai is, you basically upload 20 photos of yourself. A specific AI of yourself gets trained on your photos. It knows how you look like. It can basically spit out anything that looks like you. So you can make a prompt that says, okay, Danny as a male warrior in Game of Thrones, and it will just make a picture for you that looks exactly like you in the Game of Thrones style could be in an anime style and anyone already like everyone knows lensa so lensa launched one month after i launched this product um coincidence they did really well i think they earned like 30 million dollars on the app store right now should have made an app so yeah but they did they do it pretty simple and i'm actually trying to build it out into a bigger product so we're doing linkedin headshots um basically trying to turn it into a photo studio right now because it actually outputs photo like quality Someone shared it on Twitter when he was asking followers, like, where do you think I made this photo? And no one guessed it was AI. It's it's, it's pretty mind-blowing that it's possible to just recreate photos of you. So, yeah, it's been pretty successful. I uh, didn't expect it. I thought it would be a hype, um, but it's past the hype now, three months, I think. A lot of people ask me, Greg, how do you build products that foster community? Well, I've got good news. That's exactly what Late Checkout does, my company. We partner with the largest brands in the world and fast-paced startups to design products that resonate with your community. We add a couple interesting clients every single year. So if you're interested and that sounds like you, email frontdesk at latecheckout.studio with what you're working on, what you need help with, and don't forget to mention the Where It Happens pod. Thank you. When you're building you know, any startup and you see competition, especially well-funded composition, like Lenza is highly funded, Silicon Valley funded, Silicon Valley based, I think. You get that bad feeling in your stomach. At least I do. When I see a competitor come out with a similar technology or product, how did you feel when you when you saw it? And how do you think about differentiating your product going forward? So with Headlime, I, I freaked the fuck out every time a big competitor got VC funding, got exposure, got angry that they stole my ideas, blah, blah, blah. Basically, after I sold it, a few months later, I just saw like the competition I was afraid of didn't go that far. But also what I realized is, is like, if you want to stay small, you're a bootstrapper, you're an indie hacker. It's only good if a competitor builds something like you because they have the money to create awareness. Like for Lenza, for example, like I got 10 times more sales after they launched a the product because suddenly people, like most of the people, they were suddenly searching for like 
AI avatar, right? But some people, they didn't use the word AI avatar. They used AI profile picture. So where do they end up? Because my my domain name is profilepicture.ai. They end up my my website. So now these days, I think like, okay, yeah, it's great if some big shots, marketing, money spender, build something like me because they do the marketing for me. I'll eat the scraps. I'm happy with it. I don't need to do 30 million revenue because I don't have any employees to pay for them. So I've, I only see it as something positive right now, to be honest. I also think that you, again, you're at a crossroads and you can decide where you want to take the product. So where do you think Lenza is taking it and where do you want to take it? I think what Lenza is eventually going to do, but I'm pretty sure Instagram or TikTok is going to go there. It's like you will have your own editor of your own face where you can just type in what you want to see right now and it just outputs the photos for you. I think that's where they might head to. Um, so I've decided not to go that route because there's going to be a lot of competition. I really like to work on new ideas and build it out, but I've realized there's so much potential in this, like the whole Provo picture. It's it's massive for some reason. I shouldn't share too much about it, but there's like so much volume about it that it's a good way to just niche down and just focus on that part. Just get really good in it. And what I've realized is I like to build companies that are 100% automated. So I want to bring this to a position where it's 100% automated, basically only has to do live chat, which my wife does. And then I can move on to another product. Uh, SEO traffic comes in, it earns five, six figures a month, and I'm happy with that. And then build right. the next product, add it to the portfolio, and maybe in 10 years have like 100 AI products doing the same amount of revenue. It's a really good realization that you had that I think the, you know, the Instagrams, the TikToks are obviously looking at the success of products like yours and Lenza and are like, how do we get involved here? So it might get commoditized. And the beauty about being an indie hacker, not a bootstrapper, not raising money is you don't need it to be super big for it to be yeah. life changing. Which is that that's also like a decision with the indie hacker, right? Like you, you could build it into a big company. You could go to millions and millions of visitors, but that would also mean like if I get million of customers, like how am I going to handle the whole support load and everything? It means I have to hire a whole team. So it's also deliberately trying to like, of course, I would love to have 30 million sales, whatever <laughs> tonight, but that would mean I have to build a bigger team. I don't want to manage the whole fucking team. I, I've, I've got two amazing people around me now, which is my friend and my wife. Like I trust them. They're super smart people and it goes easy because I know they're, they know what to do themselves without me having to manage them. So it's perfect. I'm still doing the same thing. I just get some help with it. And that's like a deliberate choice. I love that. I think... Um... What's your what's your take on it? What what would you do in such a situation? Like, would you be the one that grows it out bigger? Is there a middle way to go? In a space like this, which is there's a ton of eyeballs on it, I think that most likely either Instagram wins, like the platforms win, or Lenza figures out how to become the platform, or the platform integrates with Lenza or your product to power it. So those are the scenarios I see. It's very difficult to become a platform. Like for you guys to become like an Instagram competitor or Lenza to become an Instagram competitor is remarkably difficult because of how difficult it is to build social products. You know, a social product, you have two sides, right? You have the content creation and then you have the consumption. Although I would argue that building AI-based social networks is a lot easier than building regular social networks. Because if you're building Instagram in 2009, you have to figure out how can I get really interesting content creators on one side? How do I get the right people on and to post the right content so that they interact with it? In an AI world, I mean, you still have to make sure that the content is high quality. People are getting engaged with it. But it's easier to bootstrap the network, so to yep. speak, with AI. But well, it's still... You can make 10,000. You can make 10,000 A-lists who are posting fake posts on Instagram, right? And bootstrap that's it that right. way. That's right. However, I do believe that people are going to assume creating virtual celebrities, virtual influencers are, oh, I just put a prompt in and that's it. Like, it's actually going to be a lot harder to develop great stories, great concepts, that resonate with people. 
But yeah, I, I don't think, you know, building a platform is too difficult. If I were you, I would focus on just how do you niche down into something that realistically the Instagrams of the world or the lenses of the world are not going to do, but to you could be literally tens of millions of dollars a year of revenue, which would be significant. Uh, I don't know the answer to like what that exact product is, but I would do the product design sprint around what is something that like, what is something lens I wouldn't do? Well, I guess they, they always want to grow bigger, right? So they're going to go broad. They're going to use broad terms. Yeah. If you think about SEO. So if you focus on a niche keywords, I think that's a really good thing to do. Any, any startup is going to bloat and it's the same with any other tool. Like if you can just take a specific little part of any big tool that people love and you're not going to add a shit ton of features to it because you want to grow bigger, then you have a reason to exist. Yeah. I also think what you're doing is really smart with, uh, you know, building your own virtual influencers with this model does not exist. That's an example of like Instagram isn't going to create virtual influencers. Like that's too quote unquote small <laughs> too for them. Creepy. <laughs> and creepy, <laughs> too creepy for too them. Probably. And they can't do it. Yeah. And, and Lenza too is probably not thinking about that, but I think that is it crazy that a virtual influencer brings in 500,000 to a million dollars a year of ad and affiliate revenue? It's not crazy. And then could you put together 10, 15, 20, 30 of those? It's not crazy. And then could you generate 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollars of people learning about profilepicture.ai because they see your technology and they want to do it for themselves? Not crazy. Maybe I should put some more love in into this model that doesn't exist. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why that's why I DM'd you on Twitter. I was like, this cool. this is a guy who understands where the world of AI is going and is building products to speak to it that are very bespoke and interesting. I'm curious how his brain works. What other products through your product studio have you have you built? So I build a Typical. Build a stock photo website that's fully ran on on AI. I don't know if you saw it. Stockai.com. Actually, yep. just shut it down. Basically, the whole team around all these products I'm trying to build right now is you're trying to replace something where you need a lot of people for, and you just automate it with some robots. I just love building robots that work for me at night, doing things that wasn't able to do before. So with Stockai, the thing was, hey, all these stock photo websites, they need photographers to make content for them, right? So it's like, what happens if you just build a robot, train a model that's really good in stock photo, style photos, and just have it run 24-7 and spit out new photos? So generated like hundreds of thousands of photos. The problem is for now is like the quality is too low to be able to use as stock photography. Like it's a novelty. It works for the profile pictures, it works for the, the, for the faces because it doesn't have to be perfect. But with stock photography, if there's one thing off, no one wants to use it on the website. So what I did is I trained the whole model on it, tried to do it, but it didn't get any engagement. It got a lot of social press, a lot of visitors and everything. Though the conversion rate to a paid product was like 0.004%. And it's not cheap to run AI models, man. So if you want to keep this up, I had to kill it. But I think someone is probably Shutterstock is going to do this really well because they have like the whole database of photos, right? They could, they could literally... I think in two years, put all their photographers out of a job and just have an AI generate the photos for them. Just diving into the reason why this failed. Is it because you didn't have a big enough data set versus iStock Photo, who has like a I massive? The, I think the quality is not there yet. That's the whole issue. So you can generate all these photos right now and have a database, but... If the quality of the models in the AI is not good enough yet, it's like such a waste of time, money, and resources. Because no one, like, people were barely downloading them either. So I think it's too early yet. And the thing is, like, you have Unsplash, which has millions and millions and millions of free photos, which are really good, high quality. That's what you're competing with, with a stock photo website. So if your quality is not on par, then why would people use your tool in that sense? So... Even if iStock Photo were to launch something today, what you're saying is it probably wouldn't be able to compete. So Especially for realistic ones. I think like Midjourney is getting really close to being really good in artistic quality, like paintings, 
that it's it could replace that but for realistic photos for real photography it's not there yet so with provopicture.ai for example i need to make sure that the hands are hidden under the table in the pockets of the jacket because it sucks in making hands all these like little limitations that it's like you could use it for a profile picture because it's fine like you can crop it out but the ai is not there yet to replace the iStock photo get the images or whatever so this is one of those ideas that you did, stock AI, that it's basically a timing thing. So is this something yep. that you, you would potentially revisit in 6, 12, 18 months? Yes, with two caveats. I want to see who wins Getty versus Stability AI. Because Getty is in a lawsuit now with the creators of this open source model. I don't want to get sued as a one person. Basically, that was going through my head too. I was like, if Getty drops a lawsuit on my doorstep, which they would do if I grow hard enough, how am I going to fight it? So I have to kill the product. So it will be a waste of six months of working for it. Why does Getty feel like they could run a lawsuit here? Like what, what grounds do they have? So this whole stable diffusion AI is trained on a 5 billion image data set called Layen, I believe. I don't know if you know the name. And I think they found a few of their photos in the data set. So they were like, all right, you trained on our copyrighted uh, photos. Time to sue. Because they're probably fucking scared that they're going to lose their money, right? Plus, it's trained on their copyrighted images. So I guess, yeah, they have a point if that's true. Uh, you cannot prove it because the black box of AI. And Getty is is a really big business. They're about a $2.5 billion business. I believe they're publicly traded. And I noticed that iStock Photo also has been teasing out some of their AI that they're doing. iStock Photo is owned by Getty, right? Oh, is it? Okay. I think it is. So basically... Sounds like the stock photography, besides from Unsplash, space is basically monopolized by Getty. Yeah. With Shutterstock having probably a little dip in the toe, but for the rest, yeah. You know, would you ever consider, you know, reaching out to Getty or Shutterstock and being like, hey, I built this and maybe there's a way we can partner? They're, they're going to do it themselves. They, they, they could probably acquire a company that's going to do it, but it's not, like we said, it's the focus. It's not my interest. I think my interest is right now in this whole visual one, training on the faces, seeing, getting to see where you can take these fake Instagram models and whatever in the stock photo. It, it doesn't it doesn't interest me that much. It does. It also, like, I build in public, it doesn't get that much engagement on Twitter either. It doesn't get shared that much because it's, it's pretty boring. Like, who the fuck likes stock photography, right? It's more interesting to do, like, some interesting businesses. Could you talk more about tattoos.ai? <laughs> it was the first one I made, actually. It's actually getting some sales. So what I did is I made a little editor. You can basically type in, okay, what kind of tattoo do you want? Let's say a bunny with a black hat. Um, my AI adds some prompt magic around it. You can select a tattoo artist style, and it comes up with a flash sheet of tattoos. Um, there was actually a guy who tattooed one of my tattoos that were generated on his leg, which was pretty dope, to be honest. <laughs> And how does the pricing model work? Um, it's $9. You get access for 14 days. I think I get one or two sales a day. It's starting to rank on Google, which is quite fun because every tattoo that gets generated, I take the prompt, turn it into like a search engine, and then it generates automatically the pages for it. So you could have like a bunny tattoo, shark tattoos, wave tattoos. So yeah, Google will pick it up if people search for it. I think that's quite interesting with, with AI. Like you can churn out so much content, rank in Google with it, and in that way get search volume to your websites. It's interesting that you, you talk about SEO because at least the people I follow on Twitter who are in the AI space, they're constantly tweeting about how you know SEO is dead, SEO is dead. And I couldn't disagree with them more. Uh, could you talk more about the role of AI and, and SEO? So if you know Chet GPT, right? I, I, probably everyone in this podcast knows it by now, right? Yes. You're not, you're not going to go to Chet GPT and be like, hey, um, I want to make Provo pictures. And that, it, it, is, it cannot. Like, There is search intent search and there is information search. Information search is going to be completely disrupted by 
or chat to GPT. Like, why would you go to Google and ask for a recipe? You, you, you can ask AI that it will come back with some content. But if you're looking for a solution for like making a profile picture, getting a tattoo, whatever, like you, you, you're still going to go to Google to find a website that can do that for you. And there's no way that AI can solve something like that. Does the current wave of AI tools make it easier, harder to rank in, in Google? Mm, I don't write my copy that much with those tools because I'm afraid Google penalizes it. I just think it's easier to make content in yes. that sense. Because, for example, I have a website, lendingfolio.com. It's, uh, I, I sell templates for websites there. Like, I had to hire a developer, a designer, wait for six months for them to make content. And only then you can start ranking on Google because you made the product. But with AI, you can literally on the fly produce a content. A user goes to your website, generates something for themselves, and you use it to publish on your website. So your content gets created for you automatically. So I think it's super easy to grow on social media in that sense. Like, for example, the tattoo, like that content ranks. Google likes content where people stay. So if they don't if they don't bounce after like one second and say, okay, yeah, this is garbage quality. I don't want to be here. Like, you're going to get penalized. But apparently, it, it's good quality. So Google sees that. You stay on the website for one minute. You don't go back to the search. So you're going to stay there. Yeah, I think like, you know, the secrets to SEO is exactly what you said, is getting people to stay on page. Well, it's you're like, going to make something they want and then keep them on yeah. the page. You just have to be... You, you, there's no fucking hack with it. Like it's, I think it's such a bullshit. Sorry for the words. But you just need to make things for people that they want. Use the keyword what they're looking for, which you put on the banner of a supermarket. Like you're, you're searching for a supermarket. You see a supermarket sign, right? And people come to your product. And have other reputable websites point to your website that says, okay, you know, I'm the New York Times and like I'm linking to it. So I think that having press, having social links is really, really impactful as well. So, and then a little, if I, if I may, a little side note with that, I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I build in public because it generates press for your new product which means you're going to have instant backlinks, like hundreds of backlinks on the day you launch. And Google's just going to rocket it to the top of the search engine instead of that you have to wait for like six months before they pick it up. Like people say, oh, you do it to sell your product. No, no it's literally, I just want backlinks. <laughs> I like to share what I'm building. I like to interact with the community, with people I meet. Like this is how I meet you, right? Which I think is really cool about Twitter. But it's, it's really backlinks. That's the magic use for it. What's really cool about SEO in general is, you know, it's a very boring way to get passive income, right? Like you invest in SEO. You don't invest in Facebook ads. You invest in SEO because in 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, you're you're seeing the dividends of all that build and public stuff that you've done, all that content you're generating. So I'm excited about how AI is going to help builders uh, mm-hmm. especially indie builders, create more content than they, they've ever been able to create. Yeah. I think if you're making blog posts now to rank to the number top of Google, like content marketing, you're, 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 you're done, you're fucked. But if you make tools and products and something like this, and that's how you rank on Google, I think you have future success. So tattoos AI, you know, there's already someone with a literal tattoo your models have created. You know, do you envision a world where you walk into a tattoo shop and you prompt a robot and the robot, just like we were talking about in the coffee shop, it's like a robot arm in, instead of serving it, serving you an espresso or a cappuccino or a latte, it's just starting to draw on you in permanent ink. Like our Would tattoo, you, we- <laughs> our tattoo artists going to be out of work. I, I I genuinely I have had a lot of discussions with this. Like you're not gonna get a machine to touch you. That's I would be so scared, man. Like there's gonna be two types of uh, tattoo artists. Like some of them obviously are gonna be scared because there's suddenly an AI that can do the design. Then on the other side, I think there's gonna be a lot of artists who are gonna use it as an inspiration source. They're gonna generate, like there's gonna be a customer. They can just suddenly generate like 100 options instead of just one or two, show it to the customer, and then they fine tune it based on what the customer really wants. 
So I think it's going to be like an inspiration tool, a way for them to communicate faster with the customers and then get to the tattoo they want. Why do you say that you can't imagine a machine tattooing you? Because like, to me, I can't imagine a self-driving car because the logic I make is airplanes are basically self-driving. Like the pilots are there just to supervise, basically. There's probably more room for human error than there is machine error, especially as as we, you know, in two, three, four, five years. So why do you say that uh, you can't imagine the majority of tattoos being machine, machine led? Might be because I'm scared of needles. So I'd be like even more scared if a rogue right. robot is going to tattoo me and I'm going to move my arm and it doesn't register that I'm moving my arm. So it's going to start to step me or something. It's such a wrong thing to think about because there's probably a way less error prone for a robot to do those things. But I wonder, man, like you, right. you, you, would you let a robot tattoo you? I wouldn't let anyone tattoo me because I <laughs> don't want tattoos. <laughs> but if I <laughs> if I was getting a tattoo... You know, if you're uh, Richard Branson and you're like, hey, come with me to the moon, I wouldn't come with you to the moon. I don't want to be the first person or one of the first people to do any of that stuff. I'm one of those people that kind of like, um, I, let me wait and see to see like how the first 20,000 tattoos have have turned out and like do my due diligence and then from there make a decision. I do think though that the arrow of progress is towards machine driven tattoos like i think that's where it's going to go what you're probably going to see is it's going to be crazy at first someone's going to do it i can like picture the press release right now or the new york times article whatever then it's going to be less crazy because more people are going to do it and you're going to have humans supervising the machine and then eventually there won't be humans supervising the machine. Most tattoos will be done by robots and a small percentage of them will be done by humans. Really curious, Kado, because it's it's like it's an artistic process in that sense that the artist matters. Like my wife has a lot of tattoos and she searches for the artist with the style, the way of doing it. So I think the tattoo artist, it's not just, hey, I want a picture on me. I find a tattoo artist to do it for me. It, but it might also be because that's how it works right now and in the future, like... How about this? Like uh, right now I'm, I have this like cottage that I'm in, in a mountain town in in Quebec, in Canada. And there's, you know, probably about 10,000 people who live in this town. And let's say I go on the internet one day and I find this incredible artist in Amsterdam. And for whatever reason, I can't get to Amsterdam. I'm just in my town. Wouldn't it be amazing for me to be able to walk into my like main street in my in my little town walk into this like robot store and basically just like how you can reuse prompts just go in and be like hey i love this artist what would this artist do in the tradition of designing my dog or my dead dog or you know passed away relative or something like that on my on my shoulder but wouldn't that be the same as going to a shady shady store buy some fake pokemon cards and play with your friends with your fake pokemon cards like yeah it looks the same it is the same but it's not the same in that sense like okay yeah you got the same style as the artist but the artist didn't do it does it still give you the same fulfillment you could go to a local art tattoo artist and be like hey i want this exact tattoo from that artist like yeah but it might be might be difficult to do i mean i i can't answer the question like as, as someone who doesn't do tattoos, like, or doesn't yeah, like tattoos. It's tattoo, quite hard for both of us. <laughs> it's hard both for both of us. But I, I do think that if it's done right, and if it's blessed by the artist, I could see yep. a world where someone is excited to get that tattoo. Yeah, it's um, an interesting future, man. It's an interesting future. Your studio is called Post Crafts. People could check it out at postcrafts.com. What's one thing you want to leave our listeners with? Let's say you just want to start out, build a new product. You don't know where to start. I'd say go to hdrefs.com. Keep on typing in keywords of things that you might be interested in until you find a collection of keywords that has a keyword difficulty under 10, which means you should be able to go to the first page of Google. Build a product around that that could be automized, 
where you could make some content with that can rank on the website, build it with no code, without with code or whatever. And you should be able to start a side business for yourself. That's the thing. I think a lot of people, they know how to build things. They just don't know how to launch it, how to market it or whatever. And I think SEO is the easiest way to start with it if you find like some niche to operate inside of. I think that that would be my tip. I think everyone should launch something. Yes. Just putting it out there. like, Man, just like build something to scratch your own itch. Like my first tools, I build a headline for myself because I sucked in making headlines. So I build it for myself. And like, if you're lucky, someone else needs it. So if you're lucky, really lucky, thousands of others need it. Um, and if not, you build something for yourself that makes your life easier. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. People can go follow Danny on Twitter. Uh, he's a must follow, uh, especially if you're interested in the world of AI. And your account is what? At Danny, P-O-S-T-M-A-A. Yes, Danny Postma with the XIA. And I build in public all my startups, tweet about AI mostly these days, tweet about what I'm building, testing and everything. So give me a follow. Come back anytime, Danny. Thank you so much. It was a great chat.